we get to listen to her off in an empty tomb. We're just by that. I remember the first time she came to empty tomb, and we're just a small little church down in South Omaha, but she knows some people that I know. You know, that's, that's how these things go. And she showed up, and she went up to sing for us. And she sang all over the world. She sang in Italy in some of these beautiful cathedrals. And she said, I don't feel the presence of the Lord in those beautiful places that I feel in this little church. And so she said something. One day she said, when you start traveling, I want to go with you yes. and sing for you. So here we go, Judy. Let's see the album. The problem is at church, usually, after she sings and I step up, everybody kind of, <laughs> that's no respect. You know what I mean. But would you shake someone's hand and tell them you're a candidate for a miracle tonight? I'm a candidate for a miracle. I have a miracle right here in my head. Shout oh, hallelujah if you believe <laughs> I want to speak tonight from something the Holy Spirit gave me a couple of days ago. You know, revival is what my heart, if you poked my finger, I would believe revival. I've been hungry for revival for 30 years. I had a word from a brother from Africa right saying that God can bring revival to the most. Revival is what we want. And when Sean and Burton let me know that we were going to have something tonight, last Saturday I was riding my motorcycle and I was saying to the Lord, knowing that there were going to be church people here. And I said, Lord, what do you want me to say to these people? Riding my motorcycle over in Iowa. And he said, I want you to introduce them to me. And I thought to myself, oh, Lord, they know you. But you know, folks, we live in a time in a, in a, when I don't think we really know the same Jesus that rose from the grave in the church today. I think because of our sinfulness and our disobedience that we have brought him down to a level that we can stomach because of our sinful life. The Bible says judgment starts at the house of God. And so revival starts, as my shirt says, in the mirror. It starts with me saying, Steve, you're out of the will of God. You have offended God. You're compromising the sin. And so I asked him what to speak on, and he gave me a scripture I'm going to share with you tonight. After I'm done, and I won't be long, as far as you know. <laughs> Thank you. We want to pray for the sick. Burton sent me a message in John, and he had a vision of the five angels that were going to be up here praying with us. Yes. And there are people showing up for prayer. And it's no accident. What a blessing to finally be. Hey, George. And uh, June, I'm Steve. I've been here a couple times. haven't met you, but I've been praying for you. So what a blessing. And so I want to share with you from the Word of God from 1 Samuel. Chapter 15. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them. Kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them, and tell you, 200,000 foot hook soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul and the Canaanites, or the Kenites, go uh, said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. 
So Saul attacked the Amalekites at Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag, king of the Amorites, or Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatling, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back from following me, and he has not performed my commandments. And he grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to call Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he went, and he has gone on around, and passed by and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. They have, huh? They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. And Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, you were not head of the tribe of Israel. And did not the Lord anoint you king of Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then have you disobeyed the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and gone on the mission which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, king of the Amalekites. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, and the best of the things. He saw telling the people, it was the people's fault, which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying, obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you also uh, he has also rejected you from being king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned around to go. Saul seized the edge of his robe and he tore so Samuel said, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and he turned with me that I may worship the Lord your God. And Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. And Samuel said, Bring Agag, the king of the Amalekites, to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag into pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to Saul until the day of his death. What a, what a message. Heavy, heavy message. 
And so what was the issue here? Number one, Saul disobeyed God. He was the king of Israel, chosen, anointed. Actually, the people, God said, you have to wait and choose him. He's big, he's tall, he's handsome. It wasn't like David. He wasn't a man after his own heart. But they wanted a king. God gave him a king. God is holy. And when God says something, he means for it to be done just the way he says. And I believe the reason why the church today is in such a tattered condition is because, like Saul, we have not been living in obedience. I believe we partially obey God, but not completely obey God. And what did Samuel said? Partial, what did he say? To obey is better than sacrifice. Partial obedience is total disobedience. And what have we disobeyed? I mean, look at Saul. It's funny because when he gets busted, notice how he starts blaming everybody else. Oh, it was them, Lord. No, you're the king. You're the one I told you to do it. So, number one, verses 8 and 9, obedience. Turn, his obedience, he turns to disobedience. Are we really obedient to the Lord Jesus? Have we been living totally obedient to him? Or are we partially obedient? You know, we live in a church today that has become so downgraded. I wonder if Jesus walked into any of our churches on any given Sunday, if he would recognize where he was compared to the way it was when he was on the earth. Compared to the way it was when the Holy Ghost fell in the book of Acts, when Paul, Peter, and all the guys were traveling, would he recognize our churches today? I believe that we have offended the Holy God. Now, I know we're under grace. Thank God we're under grace. But grace is not an excuse to sin. And grace is not an excuse to compromise with God. We have pastors and listen, my wife says, you know, you got a lot of pastors out there who don't like you. I don't care. I love you. But you know what? Pastors are to be worshipped. Pastors need Jesus just like anybody else. Pastors are supposed to teach you how to worship God. And yeah, we got pastors out there. They want people to, you know, I need a bodyguard. And I need, oh, come on, let's get off this nonsense. We're here to honor Jesus. We're here to reach the lost with the gospel. We're here to pray for the sick that they get healed. And we're here to see Jesus Christ glorified. Aren't we? So let me give you a, a few scriptures. So Saul was told what to do, and he did it partially, and it cost him his kingdom. There's over 1,050 New Testament, just New Testament, commandments that Jesus gave us. Over 1,000 in the New Testament. Let me just give you a couple. Let's see how we do Matthew chapter 4, 17. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Are we living repented lives? Do we live a life of repentance? When we offend God, are we on our knees right away? Are we living repentant lives? Or are we just saying, No, it's okay, it's not so bad, nobody knows. You know everybody, it's God knows. And the point is, if you think nobody knows, you're in your own heart anyway. And so we need to get back to that place. We need to live a life of repentance. Every time we offend God, we need to go to Him and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Because we're going to make mistakes, because we're still wrapped in this nasty flesh. Follow me, He said, and I will make you fishers of men. How many fishers of men are in this room? Well, that's a command now. I'm sure He said it to them. He said it to all of us. He told us all to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How are we doing? Church is over. We go home on Sundays and we take it easy. We start watching TV. Some of the things we watch on TV, we ought not to be watching on TV. We become so callous. My goodness, they, they cuss on regular TV now. And they show blatant nudity on regular TV now. It's become so vile that we've become desensitized to it. But we've got to get back to the standards of Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, 11 and 12, he said, Blessed are they when men revile and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets. I don't think anybody in this room, I could be wrong, gets persecuted too much for being outspoken for Jesus. And we should. 
Sometimes we don't want to push the envelope. But listen, if we don't push the envelope, people are going to hell. And I would rather people go to heaven and hate me and think I'm obnoxious than for them to go through life thinking they're all right and go to hell. I mean, I'd rather have them go to heaven and, and hate me. They won't hate me, though. That's the good news. If they really get saved, they won't hate me anymore. They'll have to love me. Poor people. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus spoke this. Picture him saying that to you directly, right to you. Have you been letting your light so shine before all men that they see the work that you do and glorify your Father who is in heaven? Are we just kind of going through the, you know, okay, Sunday church is on, okay, hallelujah, praise the Lord, shout glory to all this. And then when church is over, you can't tell the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And, and so I'm, I'm throwing it out heavy. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but sometimes even the choir needs to get on their knees. And that's what revival is. Revival is first us. we got to say, Lord, we, we've dropped the ball. We've dropped the ball. We've got to get people back to Jesus. And the reason why people aren't coming to Jesus is because they don't see Jesus in his followers. They saw Jesus in Peter. Peter said, look at me. And the guy wants some money. Peter says, I don't have any money. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And guess what? He got up and walked. How about us? He said, I don't believe it. And that's the problem. we got to start believing. The Holy Spirit at 201, two nights ago, he said to me, don't worry about what you're going to say to these people. Put your eyes on me. Just look at me. And that's what we all need to do. Stop looking at anybody else. Even tonight when we're praying for people, I'm not going to look at blind eyes or, or people that can't walk. I'm going to look right over them. And I'm going to look in the face of Jesus and see that compassionate look on his face, knowing full well that he wants you to be healed, and he's going to heal you. And then after Jesus starts healing people and word gets out, George, you're going to have to cut some more grass down, brother, because they're not going to run to the car. I believe. I believe. Let me give you a couple more of these just things. And again, I'm not trying to browbeat you. I just, I want you and me to look at these things and say, Lord Jesus, what does my life look like to you? Are you pleased with my life? Because remember something. Not everybody who goes to heaven is going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Some of them are just going to get in by the skin of their teeth because of the grace and the mercy of God. But the ones that are going to hear well done are the ones that did what we were called to do. Yesterday I said something about we need to learn how to get in the, in the jet stream of the will of God. We need to get in the jet stream of the word, will, will of God and we got to move when God moves and we got to sit when God sits. And we gotta, we got to do His work. That's what we need. Leonard Ravenhill said people are not looking for a different description or, de uh, or definition of Jesus. He's looking for a different uh, demonstration of Jesus. We need to become Jesus' hands and feet. And the only way that's going to happen is when we take our eyes off ourselves and we put our eyes on Him and then watch and see what God's going to do. Listen here. But I say to you, love your enemies... Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. And for he maketh his son to rise on the just and the unjust. For if you love only those which love you, your what reward have you? Do not even the tax collector do the same. We're called to love people. And I'll tell you something. Many years ago I was preaching in the church in North Omaha. And while I was giving the message, the Holy Spirit said to me, do you love these people? He said it to me twice, do you love these people? And I'm speaking, and he's speaking. And then he said, because if you don't love them, come down from there. And, you know, so I, I, that wasn't just for me, that's for all of us. We need to ask him, teach me how to love your people. I don't know how, Lord, if you don't teach me, but if you teach me. So when I made this, Jesus said, love your enemies. Are we loving our enemies? You know, there's a whole segment out there today, uh, pro-life versus uh, pro-choice, pro-death. But there's a lot of people out there calling themselves Christians, and they're ready to go to battle and blows and speak hateful things and speak violence 
against the people who don't believe like they believe. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus will deal with them if they don't repent. Our job is to have compassion on them and mercy, realizing that they are the way that they are because they're totally blind. And we need God. We will, I want to be like Jesus and have compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's what the church needs to hear today. We've got to become the church again. And so now we've got a whole segment out there that call themselves Christians. They're no more Christians than I am in six foot seven. But they believe abortion's wrong. Great, I believe abortion's wrong. But I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I've repented of my sins. I've given my life and I'm saved. There's a difference. And so we need to become lovers of God and lovers of people. Even our enemies. That's what we need to do. Give you a couple more and I'm going to pray. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? All of us love our families. Or we should. But what about those, he says, but don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if we salute your brethren only, what do you have more than others? So do the tax collectors. But he said, therefore be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How is your perfection? In the light of the glory and the grace of Jesus Christ, how are you doing? Now, I'm doing really bad. I'll be honest with you. Because when I step out and do something stupid, it convicts me of it, and I come and I say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. But we've got to keep these things on our minds. We can't just get into the jet stream of filth, the jet stream of sin, the direct jet stream of wokeism. We need to get into the jet stream of holiness, and we need to start becoming people of God again. That's what the church needs to hear. That's what the church needs to do. Here's another one. Lay up not for yourself treasures upon this earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, where neither thieves does, do not break in nor steal. For whereas your treasure is, there is your heart. What kind of treasure do you have? What kind of eternal treasure have you got last? Now, if you've got money, praise the Lord, you know. Especially if you know how to use it for God's glory. But if your goal is to make money, and that goal to make money is above your goal to win souls, something's wrong. It really is true. So my, my word to you as we see how Jesus sent Samuel, how God the Father sent Samuel to speak to Saul in his disobedience, I believe Jesus is saying to us today, church, in America, you've compromised. You've left me. You've forgotten me. I want you to repent. And I want you to be filled again with my spirit. And I want you to do the things I've called you to do. And I want you to be the people of the light, not people of the darkness. That's the difference. That's what we've been called to do. And so this is what is going to happen. When revival hits and the church starts coming out and people start getting their lives right again with God, I hope pastors come out here. I do. We've got a couple of pastors here today and I'm blessed that you're here. Then, when the church gets in her place again and becomes the spotless bride of Christ that we're out to be, not a harlot, Jesus wants a bride, pure, not a harlot. And I don't know when he looks down today what he sees in you know, uh, in Glenwood. Does he see a, 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 a bride pining for the bridegroom, weeping over what he weeps over? So it's really important for us to get our lives right. And then when the church gets right with God, then unbelievers are going to start showing up down here. And then people are going to get be saved by the scores. Saved by the scores. And there are going to be people, I'm telling you, you're going to hear about this all the way to California. I believe it. I believe the Spirit of God is going to hit like a nuclear weapon here, and it's just going to mushroom cloud over the whole nation. I really believe it. In the name of Jesus, I declare to be so. So, First thing we got to do is each one of us needs to have the courage to look at our own hearts and say, you know what, I think I've been on the throne longer than I should have been. 
You know there's no room for, the, for us on the throne. No room for us. Only one can be on the throne. And so I will just ask you tonight to examine your heart and ask Him to show you any area of your life that you have compromised with Him. That you have offended Him. If there's sin in your heart that you've not dealt with, I pray tonight that you're going to repent of it. You're going to get right with God. And I pray that you will become the man or the woman of God that He's called you to be. Because, my brothers and sisters, He deserves us to be absolutely what He wants us to be. He deserves us to be what He died for us to be. And what we've given Him is not what He deserves. What I've given Him is not what He deserves. And so I ask you, Lord, forgive me. So take just a few minutes and ask God to forgive you. Take a few minutes and just take, just search your heart. And you know what? We're all family here. And there's not one person here that can't say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And you know, you might be an elder in your church or you might be the head pastor. It doesn't make any difference. If you need to get right with God, let's get right with God tonight. Because once we get right with God, then He's going to bring more people. And we're going to help them get right with God. And then He's going to bring more people. And we're going to help them get right with God. And that's what revival is going to look like. So take just a few minutes. If you've offended Him in any way, if you have fooled around with pornography, if you have compromised with sexual sin in any way, I ask you now to take that to the Lord. If you have lied, if you have stolen anything, if you've cheated, if you've not put God in the very first place, He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. If that's not what we've been doing, ask Him to forgive me tonight. I mean, He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, not just part of your heart, just like Saul. He killed most of them, but God said, kill them all. And so I'm saying to you, whatever it is, if you've treated your wife unkindly, if you've treated your husband unkindly, then go to the Lord. If you treated your, your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever it is, unkindly, if you've conspired to make yourself wealthy in any way, ask God to forgive you tonight. Let's make it right tonight. Don't leave here without getting right with God. And then after we get right with Him in our spirits, and then we're going to have people come forward for prayer, and no matter what you've got going on, if you've got a, 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 a physical issue, we want to pray for you. If you have a, an emotional issue, we want to pray for you. If you have, I mean, there could very well be some demonic attachments here. Satan can't possess people of God, but he can sure harass them. And so, and you know how? Because when we compromise and we open that door, he says, sure, I'll come in. And then he tampers down. And when the Holy Spirit starts to convict you, Oh, no, that old devil, he steps in. No, it's not that big of a deal. Don't worry about it. Nobody's ever going to know. Come on, man. Let's get right with God. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all-loving. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So, Lord, we ask you tonight to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus. And, Lord, I pray that you will ascend to the place of holiness in our lives again. That you will become the potentate, the one and only, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. Now we will put you back where you belong. And Lord, if we have brought you down or tried to bring you down to our level, we beg your mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us. I pray that each one of us would walk out of here cleansed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus, totally forgiven, lifted up. And Lord Jesus, no more weight, nothing bogging us down. Lord Jesus, from this position of holiness for righteousness, when we've been wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus, then we can go forth and shine as lights to those in darkness. And so, Lord, let this group of people become your doers. Let this people, let this group of people become those who, whose hands you will use, whose words you will use, whose, whose lives you will use. And help us to go out and feed those that are hungry. And help us to go out and give cold water to those who are thirsty. And help us go to the hospitals and visit the sick. And not only visit them, but get them healed. And help us, Lord, to go to people in prison and, and visit them. And the old folks home where people get forgotten so many times. Lord, help us to become your hands and feet. Help us to become Jesus for them. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Now just take a few minutes. And I mean really go to the Lord. Young and old. Just go to the Lord. If there's anything, just take it to the Lord. And then what I would like to do is if anyone needs prayer, 
I would just like you to just come right down here to the front if you can. If you can't, we'll come to you. But we want to pray. And I believe Jesus is going to do miracles here tonight. I really do. I really do. As a matter of fact, I declare it to be so in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? Before we pray, God I put something on my heart and I almost forgot, but I want to do it. There's a song we used to do long ago. It came from the Brownsville Revival. It's called Healing in Your Glory. I don't have my guitar, but it's really easy. It's, the word is, there's healing in your glory. There's healing in your glory. There's healing in your glory. Oh, Lord, send your glory. And then we're going to see there's power in your glory. There's deliverance in your glory. And there's freedom in your glory. So sing this with me. There's healing in your glory. 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 So Lord, send your glory. Sing that again. There's healing in your glory. There's healing in your glory. There's healing in your glory. Healing in your glory. So Lord, send your glory. Freedom. There's freedom in your glory. 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 So Lord, send your glory. Deliverance. Deliverance in your glory. Deliverance in your glory. Deliverance in your glory. Deliverance in your glory. So Lord, send your Glory, glory is power. There's power in your glory. Power in your glory. There's power in your glory. There's power in your glory. So Lord, send your glory. glory. So, Lord, send your glory. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Our Father, as the people come for prayer, Lord, we just believe you to bring healing. We just declare in Jesus' name, every captive, every captive will be released tonight in the name of Jesus. Every sickness will be dealt with by the power of Jesus, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so, Lord, just do what only you can do. We bow and we praise. So, uh, pastors, would you guys come up front? Laura, if the Lord moves you to come up front for prayer, I'd like to come up front. So, of course, Joanna. And then folks that are dealing with illness of any kind, mentally, physically, spiritually, if you need help in any way, I want you to come forward for prayer. Because there's power here. Yes, sir. There's power here.